So, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, DevCon 2022. This is the first session uh, of uh, the Zoom today. And uh, the first talk uh, will be about navigating uh, the NPM ecosystem in the enterprise. And uh, it will be presented by Beth Griggs, uh, who is a senior software engineer at Red Hat. So, the stage is yours. Uh, so, hello DevConf, and um, welcome to my talk, uh, Navigating the NPM Ecosystem in the Enterprise. Uh, this will be my second DevConf, and that means, unfortunately, I've not actually got to go to one in person just yet, but fingers crossed, maybe next year. Um, to start with a little bit about me, so my name is Bethany Griggs, I'm a Senior Software Engineer at Red Hat, and I work at Red Hat in their Node.js runtime team. I've uh, been at Red Hat just over a year now, but before that I was actually doing a very similar role, but at IBM. Uh, I'm a member of the Node.js Technical Steering Committee, so quite heavily involved with the upstream community. And also spent some of lockdown uh, writing a new edition of the Node Cookbook. And my, my job role is really quite a big mix between open source, engineering and advocacy. So back to my talk topic. Uh, today, my talk's titled Navigating the NPM Ecosystem in the Enterprise. And what I want to do is share a little bit about a recent approach we've been taking at Red Hat and IBM to help our internal teams and clients navigate the vast NPM ecosystem. So for quite a long time, probably since the adoption of Node, the NPM ecosystem has been recognized as a source of friction in the enterprise, um, particularly when the package maintenance working group was kicked off in the Node community. Uh, there was a statement that said, while well, Node.js has been growing rapidly, there are aspects of the module ecosystem which act as a source of friction to adoption, particularly in the enterprise. So why is there friction? Well, there's over 1.7 million modules in the NPM registry, which is like many, many more than any of the other uh, runtimes and languages uh, registries. This means that there's quite a lot of choice out there, but that means there's a lot of good choices and actually some potentially bad choices too. And also when you look at your typical Node.js application, the large majority of the code that makes up your application is not your own. It's quite common in Node apps for this to be the case. Um, but unfortunately, you're actually responsible for all of it in production. So you can't just ignore it. You can't take it for granted. Uh, you're just as responsible for that code as the code you didn't write. And I always like to start with a few horror stories that always attract a bit of attention. So, for example, way back in 2016, there was the left pad situation. This was a quite heavily depended on module that the author unpublished and it broke loads of dependency chains. And just to show this is still happening, we get the odd case every year. Um, a similar thing happened just in January with the Faker module um, where the author actually published uh, what you would say like an infinite loop to the latest version, which broke a lot of projects. And this is not a new problem. Uh, it's definitely not specific to the Node.js or JavaScript ecosystems. But what I do find is the NPM ecosystem in particular uh, does surface these issues a lot more visibly. And that's mostly just because um, our dependency trees in Node apps are typically much wider and deeper than other languages or runtimes. And just to show um, it's not only an NPM issue, obviously we had the log for j that I'm sure you all heard about. So in the organizations I've worked with, so IBM and Red Hat, we've seen many different approaches to try and tackle this problem and to try and alleviate the concerns over the years. So this is going back to one of my first ever conference talks, which talked about one of the early approaches we took at IBM. And that included um, defining some metrics or facets of the dependencies or NPM modules you're using that really help developers make an informed choice. So it was all about providing the guidance for meet people to make a good decision on which dependencies to pull into their project. So the types of metrics we called out at the time were things like security. So does it have a good security policy? Are they patching in a timely manner? Licenses, is a license compatible with how you want to license your application? Um, maintenance, are you com fairly confident that the dependency is well maintained and will continue to be maintained for the lifetime of your product? 
And then there's also breaking changes. So what's the history in breaking changes in dependency? Are they cutting major versions really frequently and you won't be able to keep up with those? And then there's compatibility. So obviously you need to check that the uh, dependency is compatible with the platforms and runtime versions that you're targeting. So this was all about providing metrics to help people make an informed choice about which modules they're choosing. And this is an, a unique approach. Um, and actually you've got companies like Sneak and MPMSIO doing a very similar thing, trying to take some metrics from these modules and packages and formulating health scores so people can make a slightly more informed decision. But metrics really don't tell you the whole story. Um, so some of the most downloaded modules on the MPM ecosystem are probably not a good choice of what to use to build an enterprise grade Node.js application today. And one of the key things I like to highlight is governance. Governance is crucially important. I see one of the key benefits in the NPM ecosystem is that when you hit a bug or you need a new feature, you are able to invest and contribute to fix or the new feature yourself. Uh, but this does mean when you're choosing a module, you need to have confidence that if you did need to fix your own bug and help yourself, which I believe we all should be doing, um, you, you need to be confident that the dependency will actually allow you to contribute. And that might not be the case, um, particularly for, say, it's maintained by just one individual, or maybe it's controlled by another corporation. Is that something you really want to build your product on top of, or would you rather build it on top of a community-owned framework? Uh, one other approach that we have taken in the NPM uh, Node.js space is we defined a Node.js package maintenance working group. And this is a group of people from varying companies like Netflix, GitHub, um, many of the enterprises, all just getting together on a couple of week basis and trying to provide guidance for package maintainers to promote responsible consumption. They're also working on tooling to help improve things too. So it's just nice to see that there's a concentrated effort on this problem, bringing enterprise concerns to the table. Uh, so on to the new approach we've been taking at Red Hat and actually we were taking it at IBM just before our team moved over. And we're, re we're actually taking this new approach in unison with the other approaches. So this is additive in nature. We're not doing this instead of. So what we set out to do uh, to help enterprises and our clients navigate the NPM ecosystem is to build a reference architecture. And what we call reference architecture or define as is it's the team's opinion on what components our customers and, and internal teams should use when building Node.js applications and additional guidance for how to be successful in production with those components. It's essentially a set of good default choices in the NPM ecosystem to use when you're creating and deploying enterprise Node.js de deployments. And I just want to disclaim here to be clear, um, purpose of the talk is to share how we're approaching the problem. We're not saying the recommendations that we come to are right for everyone. And we're very conscious of this, even internally. Um, we're not trying to say, always use this module categorically. It's more, this is a good default. We have tried and tested experience in the organization. We may have some contributors to that module. So if you have no reason to use anything else, start with this. Um, and personally, this kind of reminds me of my personal opinions on like Lego. When I was a child, I had lots of Lego bricks and it was just a tub of assorted bricks. And if someone had come along and said, you're using these bricks and this is how you're going to do it, I probably wouldn't have been particularly happy about that. So it's not it's not about picking winners. It's not saying this module or NPM package is categorically better than another. It's just saying this is a sensible and good default. And also it's not about personal opinion. It's the opinion of the group as a whole based on evidence and experience. And on the other hand, the whole restricted usage approach being told you are using these modules um, and these tools is not unfamiliar to a lot of our enterprise customers and clients, and particularly in like the financial services and government industries, you will be told this is what you're doing, uh, this is what you can use, and these are the uh, allowed dependencies. 
Uh, and there are benefits to that approach, particularly for their organizations in terms of more efficient due diligence. So if they have to do things like license checking, they can, um, by focusing on just a small set, it's more efficient to do that and also more efficient um, risk management. So we set out to build this reference architecture. How are we actually doing this? Well, step one is to bring together all our internal teams uh, who have experience with Node.js and also anyone who's worked with customers who have experience with Node.js. And um, bearing in mind there's like over 300,000 employees between two companies um, and we've got many, many customers using the Node.js runtime we set out to find everyone that's creating or deploying Node.js applications. And so far we've built up a good group, um, probably at least 30, 40 folks um, coming to our meetings uh, over the period of the year. And our colleagues in these meetings range from people who have internal Node.js deployments for our companies, people who are working with uh, clients with Node.js deployments and more. Um, and the kind of things we're doing is like actually interviewing with our customers, learning about how they're new using Node.js, really to try and verify that our recommendations are working for our customers. And this is somewhat like an inner source approach. So if you're not familiar with the term inner source, it's essentially applying open source principles and practices within internal organizations. And there's lots of benefits to this type of approach where you get to exploit the expertise of the developers across the whole organization. So rather than just having your team, uh, you have a much larger uh, group of expertise to exploit. You also get independent peer review of recommendations by others in the developer community. And developers have, uh, can identify which areas of the project they feel they can contribute best. So once we've, we've got this group together, our next step is to define all the components that form an enterprise Node.js deployment. And initially we set out to define this based on, bear with me one sec, my monitor's just turned itself off, so I'm just going to move my laptop over. Okay, sorry. So initially we've grouped all of these components into three categories. We have development, functional components, and operations. And initially, the types of things we've defined as development components are uh, building in containers, code quality, code consistency, uh, how you keep your uh, modules and applications up to date, uh, and some specifics around NPM and proxy and publishing and more. And then under functional components, we have things like accessibility, API definition, data caching, databases, message queuing. And that's actually within the functional components that we um, surface many of the module recommendations. So there might be a very specific module that we've got lots of expertise in the organization for, for doing things like authentication and authorization. And then we have operations. Uh, obviously, operations is very heightened importance with our types of enterprise customers because they are very much likely to have massive Node.js deployments across many clusters. Um, so looking at their concerns and trying to form good defaults for them is very beneficial. And under operations, we've got things like how do you do tracing, how do you handle failures, what you use for health checks and logging. Um, so we've kind of defined this initial set of components. It's not an exhaustive list, not at all yet. Um, it's just the initial list we've started with the, with the people in the group. And then for each of the components, we talk through and share experience within the group and try to form an opinion. So I do kind of like a worked example here is logging. So logging was a, a topic that we discussed quite early on. We brought together lots of folks from IBM teams, Red Hat, even some of our uh, acquisition teams. And we talked about what are you using for logging, any recommendations, best practices, what's worked for you. And after talking in those groups um, for a few sessions, we eventually converged on the fact that Pino, which is a logging framework for Node.js, is a good sensible default. And uh, some of the justification of this included things like 
It's got good performance. It's structured logging by default, which works very well with uh, clusters and when you're deploying clusters because you can populate it easily to a uh, collection system. Uh, and generally, everyone had a good ex user experience when using the module. And it was also well maintained. So we converged on this recommendation to say, hey, if you need to do some logging in your Node.js application, Pino is a good default to choose. And actually, even more beneficial from this approach is that when we're having these discussions, we're able to surface even better guidance for our internal teams and clients. For example, uh, in the context of logging, we we're talking about how many of the teams were initially storing their logs in maybe a fast access um, location that's often more expensive. And then after maybe seven days, they migrate all of their logging data to a local storage place. Um, so what I really enjoyed about these sessions is we're able to surface um, not just, hey, you should use this module, but also uh, when you're using these modules and building a Node.js application, these are some good approaches to take as well. Uh, and then uh, from our perspective, once we've converged on a recommendation, um, it's really helpful for us to be able to converge all of our examples, all of our demo apps, uh, all of our tutorials to use that recommendation. So uh, there's been quite a lot of benefits to our approach that we've taken so far. And um, first one is just finding contacts. Uh, our team in particular have a lot of people who are working in the upstream community and just having opening that communication between the product teams and ourselves is really mutually beneficial. If they have a bug in node, we can work in the upstream to fix it. And we're getting feedback from the people actually using the runtime. It's also really good knowledge sharing. We've actually seen teams helping each other and suggesting better practices for them to make. And we've also got recommendations on hand for our clients. So if our clients are stuck and they're like, we just don't know what to do for logging, we can say, hey, take a look at this. This is a good place to start. And also, we also get those benefits around more efficient due diligence. And one of my favorites is more focused open source contributions. So in many organizations, not necessarily our own, um, many developers struggle to get the kind of management backing to contribute to open source because obviously it takes work time. If there was a restricted set of modules or a smaller set of modules that you could focus on and the whole organization are using the same module for their Node.js logging, that justification is easier to say, hey, our whole organization is relying on this module. We're going to contribute to it. It's, it's just more focused and it may help folks in smaller organizations that can't justify contributing to every module that's out there. So really our reference architecture approach has been to bring together the internal teams and customer engagements with all the related experience, uh, to get together and define all of the components that form a Node.js application or deployment. And then for each component, we discuss the experiences within the group and form an opinion on a good default. Once we've done that, we actually document all our recommendations on GitHub. Uh, and this gives us benefits because it means it goes through the proper PR process. People can add their thoughts and feedback. And actually, we're continuously evaluating our recommendations. Uh, and this is because what is a good choice today may not necessarily be a good choice in the future. And we've even gone as far as trying to predict some future trends, uh, particularly in the web framework space. So today, uh, from hearing from all our internal teams and clients, we're hearing, still hearing a lot about Express. Everyone's starting with Express. Uh, we've got numerous success stories internally from the IBM Cloud UI uh, and some Red Hat deployments using Express. Uh, but then we also have the IBM Cloud Garage. And if you're not familiar with the IBM Cloud Garage, it's kind of like a hub for clients to come in and build applications. And from our colleagues there, we learned that they, the clients are still asking to use Express. So generally, we're happy that today, if you don't have any reason to use anything else, using Express as your web framework is probably a good choice. It has high downloads, it's wide knowledge, and it's tried and tested. But there are concerns raised in these sessions. Um, the Express project is kind of considered to be in a maintenance phase. 
contributions have been tailing off for quite some time. Uh, up until, I think, this month, we haven't had a release for a couple of years. Um, so there is concerns about the slow release cadence. If I needed a bug to be fixed and I've got to wait two years for it to be uh, released, that's going to be a problem. There's also some concerns about with it having such a slow release cadence, it's not going to keep up with the evolutions in the runtime. So even though today we're saying Express is a good default, we're already thinking it might not be in, say, five years' time. Um, so actually to try and identify what might be next and where we should maybe invest some of our time, uh, we looked at pulling some metrics. So first of all, I just built a spreadsheet for some very high level metrics for many of the popular web frameworks. And actually we purposely didn't compare like for like replacements of Express. Um, in node space, five years ago, to build an app, you would have probably always defaulted to Express. But actually, there's a lot more choice and a lot more specialist frameworks now that you may choose something slightly different, like Next, to build your application. So as we expect, um, looking at downloads, Express is still massive, like 22 million versus the Next framework, which is at 2 million. But um, it was just useful context to see uh, which frameworks are, are being most used today and most downloaded. Uh, Download stats aren't very good, though. Obviously, they are um, impacted by CIs, build systems. The fact that Express was like the tutorial framework for the first five years means that there's still a lot of tutorials out there using it. So that will mean that the downloads may not necessarily reflect uh, what's happening in real deployments. Um, also, the fact that the registry downloads are increasing year on year by quite a large number means that uh, you want to really be looking at the relative increases and decreases in the module. Uh, so we did pull some stats to just look at the percent share of total registry downloads per year. And what's interesting here is you can see, even though the express downloads are increasing every single year, its actual share of the downloads are tailing off. And there's many reasons that can be the case. It's not necessarily to say Express is losing favor, but the fact is it's not gaining share. So what we really want to look at are the modules at the bottom here, where they've got very low downloads, but actually a lot of them are growing in share. So these modules are growing in share while Express is losing it. So they're definitely ones we want to keep an eye on, have discussions with our clients and customers about. Hmm. Excuse me, Beth, uh, we have two minutes left just for information. And um, so other metrics we looked at were the OSSF criticality scores. Um, the OSSF actually has a tool that uses some very complicated metrics to try and define how critical that package is in the, to the ecosystem. And what was interesting there is we see Next and Fastify at the top and Express further down. We also were looking at contribution activity Many of the frameworks that you probably know from the node space actually have the trend showing in the top graph for our peak of activity and tailing off. And then, but some of the frameworks that we're looking at with the increases are showing relatively active contribution activity today. Uh, one of my favorite metrics is contributor share. So the, these are actually generated based on the number of commits per user for each of the web frameworks. And one of the leading web frameworks is framework one. And you can see it's actually dominated by one person. So you kind of think as an enterprise, would we want to invest in that place? Or would we prefer to invest in a framework like framework three, where you can see that the contributions are more spread and that can indicate it's more of a community owned framework. So that, that may, um, alleviate some of your concerns around ongoing maintenance, because obviously hit by a bus scenario on framework one, what are you going to do? When will we change our recommendation? Really just when we uh, see usage internally migrating away from Express, when we have numerous tried and tested experience with another framework, and we're continuously evaluating because we find it useful to predict what's happening next. I'm, I'm sorry about that, but uh, we need to finish because yep. uh, it's already, uh, uh five minutes to, until the end um so uh thank you 
do, do you want to say uh, uh, some rap word, words? Uh, okay. If not, uh, so thank you very much uh, for uh, for the talk. Um, we don't have any more uh, time for the questions, so uh, feel free to go to Work Adventure, uh, uh, which is um, a bit styled virtual platform. It's really fun, so uh, go, you can go there and uh, you can uh, discuss uh, if if you want anything uh, related to this topic. So. Thank you again, Beth, and um, the next uh, session starts uh, in a few minutes.